morning, or maybe I should say uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers and um, especially Tomaso Alberti for um, inviting me. Um, well, I'm going to try and give a bit of a mix of history and future, which I, I think is what the series is about. And uh, specifically, I want to discuss two uh, what I call strands of, um, or two approaches to uh, atmospheric science uh, over the last century uh, and how they <clears throat> diverged and how they can be reunited. So um, let me get started. <clears throat> What's the problem? The problem is that we're dealing with a system with structures over a huge range of scales. And just to illustrate that in a single transparency or a slide here, you can see on the left, I have uh, a smoke plume uh, and you can see structures which may be less than one millimeter even in size. Um, and uh, up here, I have pictures of clouds taken from the roof of the physics building, which have a resolution of something like a meter or so. And uh, you can see uh, something like 10 kilometers left to right. And then on this infrared satellite picture of the Earth, I, ha I have a resolution of four kilometers up to, and I can see structures up to about 20,000. So it's a, roughly a factor of a billion. Um, and of course, in time, uh, this corresponds to, um, you know, it's the dissipation time for turbulence as corresponding to the 0.1 millimeters, which is a typical dissipation distance for turbulence. Uh, that's about a millisecond. And if we go to uh, consider timescales up to the age of the earth, then uh, uh, we have a range of about a billion billion in time where we have variability um, in, in the atmosphere. So how can we understand this? There are different um, ways, but um, so how can we understand this, this variability? And it's another way of phrasing that is what do we do about the details? Okay, so I'll come back to that. But um, one of the um, issues is, should we model the atmosphere in a deterministic way or rather in a stochastic way? And um, well, just to remind you, um, the question of uh, determinism and then later uh, stochasticity randomness is a, a, you know, a very old question in some sense, you, you know, pre-scientific, of course, we have the Greek creation myths where everything is started off with chaos and then out of chaos emerged order, which, which is cosmos. Um, but of course, scientific notions didn't really start until Newton um, who had, you know, his, uh, planetary system that was ruled completely by uh, deterministic laws of gravity and uh, laws of motion. And, um, you know, once a deity start kicked the system off, gave the initial conditions, then the planets uh, would go around their orbits um, forever in a totally predictable way. Uh, Laplace uh, had the idea of uh, a kind of a divine calculator that could in principle, according to him, it would calculate the entire past and future of the universe if enough information was available. Um, so those are kind of extreme um, Newtonian or Laplacian determinism. But, and, and at the same time, uh, when we were considering chance, um, it was considered to be something totally subjective. So Voltaire, who was a big uh, supporter of Newton, uh, said, le hasard n'est rien, meaning chance is nothing. And what he really meant by that was that it's below uh, consideration. It's just ignorance, basically. You say some event is, is a random event just because you don't actually know the causes. So it's a totally subjective problem and science shouldn't uh, care about um, chance. But of course, this, this view evolved and um, with Maxwell, 1870s, we had you know, Maxwellian distribution of velocities of molecules in a gas. Um, it was really more the fact that most of the details were irrelevant. And this is really was the view of the founders of um, statistical mechanics. Um, and, but even that then was somewhat 
unsatisfactory. So what was the source of randomness? Was it still just ignorance or was more you just thought it was ignorance, but you didn't care, they were irrelevant or could chance be purely objective without any subjective element? And that's basically the evolution that happened partly with the um, development of quantum mechanics, but also um, from the fact that Kolmogorov uh, in the 30s axiomatized probability, th uh, probability theory and showed that basically, you know, probability is a purely objective, can be purely um, objective thing. And so really, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with a purely objective probabilistic um, or stochastic model. Um, and uh, of course, stochastic models are very natural and one has a, a large number of degrees of freedom, lots of details. Um, but we had, there was a bit of a backlash though to that with um, the uh, discovery of uh, deterministic chaos, um, whereby only a few degrees of freedom, uh, in fact, as few as three could give you uh, chaotic uh, like behavior. But finally, really, we have to conclude that, um, you know, the modern conclusion is that scientific theories can be either deterministic or stochastic and neither is superior. So you have to choose the model which is most convenient and what best fits the world. Okay, so interestingly enough, the two different approaches started at the dawn of um, atmospheric science with um, Lewis Fry Richardson. Of course, Richardson is best known as the father of numerical weather prediction, right? He, in 1922, he published this book, paid for out of his own pocket, in fact, called Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. And he was the first one to set down essentially the modern equations of the atmosphere. Um, and not only that, but he developed uh, techniques for numerically, original techniques for num numerically uh, integrating the equations. And he did this in fact by hand, um, a massive calculation for the pressure tendency in this uh, box here. Um, it, he claimed himself, it took him six weeks to do the calculation. Um, and he also admitted that he was wrong by a factor of about a hundred. But um, so in fact, the, the actual cause of the error wasn't known until the 1970s. Um, it was essentially a problem of uh, nonlinear model initialization. Um, but uh, certainly uh, he, he, he's considered the, fa the father of numerical weather prediction. He just uh, was there a little bit uh, too early. Uh, the technology didn't, uh, didn't exist. Uh, really. But um, interestingly enough, he's also uh, known as the kind of the grandfather of turbulent cascades and the stochastic approach to the atmosphere. Uh, because inside this book, page, I don't know, uh, 67 or something, buried in the middle of a paragraph, is um, this, this little uh, sentence here big worlds have little worlds that feed on their velocity, little worlds have smaller worlds, and so on to viscosity in the molecular sense. And so this is, this was a paradigm of a swift poem about big fleas and little fleas, et cetera. But it gives the idea of um, a cascade essentially of, of energy from large scales to small scales that then inspired Kamalgarov and, and, and other, others later on. Um, I could say, so you could say that, okay, the, the, um, uh, the idea of uh, numerical weather prediction was vindicated in the, essentially in the 1970s, uh, but his idea of turbulent cascades, he already sort of um, tested it out with his idea of um, turbulent diffusion and what's called the Richardson four thirds law of turbulent diffusion. Uh, in 1926, he actually attempted an empirical verification. This is actually essentially the same as the Kamalgarov law of uh, turbulence and, um, I would, you know, it took, in fact, much longer to really vindicate this for reasons that um, I, I don't have time to go into, but essentially to do with uh, a debate about 2D isotropic versus 3D isotropic turbulence. But um, basically, uh, Richardson was the father then of uh, these two strands. Um, and uh, 
and, and, and those two different strands can be thought of in, in a different way, in fact. So coming back to this question, what about the details? Well, we can handle them either in a high level way or a low level way, right? Deterministic or stochastic. So what, I, what do I mean by that? Here I have a classical picture of molecules in a box. I, I didn't dare try to uh, draw a quantum uh, version of that, but it, it wouldn't make uh, any difference to my basic point. So if we have, uh, we could treat this system, uh, you know, using uh, treating every particle as a degree of, uh, in fact, several degrees of freedom uh, and uh, integrating the laws of motion. Uh, but when we have a large number of particles that becomes uh, impractical and uh, we can then use statistical mechanics, either classical statistical mechanics or quantum statistical mechanics. Um, but at some point, for instance, if we want to model a vortex um, in a fluid, then uh, you know, we'd be really wasting our time because we, you know, it was not so much that a statistical mechanical or a quantum mechanical description is wrong, it's simply that it's really totally impractical. And what we have to do is, is separate out the relevant from the ir irrelevant information. And of course, um, if we use thermodynamics and continuum mechanics, which is the basis of, of um, atmospheric models these days, um, then we don't even acknowledge the existence of molecules or atoms, right? And um, okay, so that's fine, but um, you know, so most of the details are irrelevant, but the hierarchy continues. That's the thing. So, you know, the atmosphere is not just a single vortex. And in fact, it's not even a kind of a small collection of vortices, but really it's more like this sometimes called spaghetti picture on the upper right, um, which this one is actually from a numerical simulation, but so it doesn't have nearly as many degrees of freedom as the real world does. But you can see this sort of jumble of vortex tubes um, and you could imagine that many of these details are also irrelevant and that we should be searching for turbulent laws that describe their collective behavior. So this is the, these are the two strands then. We have a, you could consider a low level continuum mechanics laws. And then what you try to do um, is to, what I say, what I call chase the, chase the details, right? With bigger and bigger computers, what you essentially use brute force to track down as many of the vortices as you can. Or you could try and develop high level turbulent laws that try to uh, capture the collective effects. And um, you know, in the 1970s, we had revolutions in both sides. We had a numerical revolution, which is still ongoing. And uh, we also had the nonlinear revolution, which included, of course, chaos and uh, fractals, as well as nonlinear waves and, and um, uh, later uh, self-organized criticality and other aspects that really gave gave birth to the nonlinear processes division at the European Geophysical Geosciences Union, whose geophysical union back then um, in the er, about 1990, actually. So, um, okay, so these strands actually pretty much separated in the 1970s. Until then, people would use, you know, numerical um, or dynamical meteorolo meteorology type approaches or uh, statistical approaches depending on the problem they had, but starting in the 1970s, there was really a separation. So what happened to the mainstream view, which was chasing the details, right? Numerical weather prediction and uh, GCMs. Well, if we want to compare the um, state of the art back then to what it is today, um, here's a kind of a goalpost, if you like. We had back then uh, about 10 to the 11 times uh, weaker computer power. Um, the algorithms, this is interesting. Peter Lynch has estimated that um, the algorithms today for integrating the equations are about a million times more efficient. Uh, and that has enabled us to improve spatial resolutions, vertical levels, add numbers of realizations. But when it comes to a key thing for um, the future of humanity, right? What's going to happen if we double CO2? How much are we going to increase the temperatures? Well, interestingly enough, that range uh, that was first estimated in 1979, uh, the National Academy of Sciences in the US 
has remained exactly the same. So the most recent IPCC report, 2013, came up with exactly the same huge range. If we double, we're anywhere between 1.5 and 4.5 degrees C of warming, 90% confidence. That's the, the still the current uh, number. And this uh, has, you know, has, has the potential of becoming an uncertainty crisis, right? Because it means that uh, we can, we, we, there's a kind of a decoupling between mitigation measures and consequences, right? If there's such a huge um, spread in, in the warming. So we really need to So I hope people can hear me. Um, so, okay, we have to reduce this. And the proposal that has been made by the mainstream, if you like, going back even to um, even to uh, 2010, there's this big uh, paper by uh, Shukla, Palmer, and about 10 other authors, where they said the goal for 2030 should be cloud resolving models getting down to, like I estimate they could get down to probably two kilometer resolution by then. But if you do that, you will be creating structures that live about uh, 30 minutes. And um, you know, if your goal is to make a decadal scale projection, then you're gonna be averaging over a factor of 100,000 in time. So you're sort of admitting that almost all of those details are irrelevant. So, but that's, that's what they propose the future to be. The other approach, the other strand, the turbulence approach, um, has focused around this uh, simple relation fluctuations in some quantity depend on a turbulent flux times a scale to some power. And uh, so uh, the originally the fluctuations were essentially just differences, uh, the difference between the temperature here and the temperature there, that was your fluctuation. The, the fluxes were considered to be fairly homogeneous, maybe quasi Gaussian. And the notion of scale was isotropic, the same in all directions. And you know, this was the view really followed by you know, these pioneers of turbulence. But since the nonlinear revolution, all of these terms have had a huge um, generalizations, right? So fluctuations, we now have wavelets, a whole theory that can give you an infinite number of different uh, wavelets depending on your taste. Uh, the turbulent flux we now know could generally be a multifractal with huge intermittency generated by cascades. Um, and the notion of scale itself um, has to be taken to be anisotropic. So it depends on your direction and your scale even. So huge generalizations, but th that means that these laws can in fact be well applied to the atmosphere. How can we deal with these details? Well, there's two, again, two extreme, you know, uh, opposite views. The first one I'm, I'm uh, attributing to Van Leeuwenhoek here, it's uh, maybe unfair to him, but he was um, famously quoted as having dis discovered a new world in a drop of water, right? He looked through the first powerful microscope and he discovered microorganisms. And since then, we've had the idea that every time you blow up by a factor of 10 or so, you see something qualitatively different, something new. And that underlined the, the view of Murray Mitchell, who back in 1976 uh, came up with the first uh, kind of schematization of atmospheric motions over huge ranges, right? So I think he didn't, you know, other people were thinking in this way, but he was the first one to actually write down or he, he dared to draw this picture, which he called an educated guess. He actually did put axes on um, his spectrum here. So the numbers here were actually, are actually his scale. But you can see that basically what he did was he identified what he considered to be important processes. So, you know, here, of course, you have a daily spike, strong spike in the temperature spectrum. You have an annual spike. You have Milankovitch uh, here. It was already uh, known from ice core data. Uh, you have ENSO. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, but the idea was you had more or less white noise or maybe Ornstein Uhlenbeck type, but fairly flat background spectrum. And all the important things were, were these bumps. And this was kind of uh, turned into, um, I shouldn't say a religion, but you know, a, a, a kind of a, um, 
you know, a, a systematic view, shall we say. Um, this, this is uh, the NOAA uh, rendition from their paleo data website in 2015. And they admit that they were inspired by Mitchell. And uh, here we see, um, you know, this is their view. They say, these are the things that, you know, we should be focusing on depending on scale. And here the background is just completely 100% flat. Okay, so I say these are the things that we, we should find, we should look at and be interested in. But uh, if you go back to Mitchell, we can now put um, actual data, including paleo data on this. And what we find is that Mitchell was really wrong by, well, quite a big factor. In fact, he was wrong by about a factor of a quadrillion, 10 to the 15. And the actual data, this is real data over here at the high frequencies um, for regional, for this is a, one degree resolution, global resolution, uh, temperatures. These are paleo data out here, but he's wrong by a huge amount. And you can see that there's evidence that really we have several more or less linear regimes on log log plots. So those are scaling power law. And uh, so really we have to turn uh, Mitchell on his head and say, look, you know, most of the variability is actually in these spikes, which are real, right? Daily spike, annual spike. We have an obliquity spike here, 41,000 years frequency, um, 800,000 to 2.5 million years ago. Uh, but, you know, so those are, you know, ENSO, et cetera, that, those can be real, but they don't actually have that much of the variability. That's the thing. So we, you know, it's, anyway, we've been, we've been focusing on really, um, you know, the wrong thing in many ways. So the opposite view then is, what I call the scaling view. And here we see uh, one of the pioneers, Mandelbrot, staring through a microscope at the, Man microscope at the Mandelbrot set. And we see that as you zoom in, you well, sometimes you can get more or less the same thing you started with, a small scale version of the Mandelbrot set. So zooming in doesn't necessarily give you something different. And, uh, you know, so here, this is just an example, you know, which of these clouds is real? One is a multifractal cloud that, you know, has been constructed. So we know that the details are simply related to the whole. Actually, there's some squashing and things going on. So it's not um, a, a trivial isotropic blow up, but still the physics are the same at all scales. And uh, okay, so this was the simulation. Um, uh, but uh, you need, in fact, to slightly improve the idea of just a, an isotropic blow up. So here, this would show a cross section um, of um, a multifractal atmosphere uh, where you blow up and blow up, blow up, but you see something that's more or less the same. But um, to be realistic, have a realistic cross section here, you would have to start with something pretty flat. You blow up and you squash, you blow up and squash, blow up and squash, blow up and squash, blow up and squash. So eventually things get more and more roundish. And this is this 23 over nine model, which is um, essentially supported by the data. The data give about 2.57 uh, plus or minus 0.02. And this is about you know 2.55 um, for the dimension then that this would imply. Okay, so, okay, so that's the opposite scaling uh, view. We can use scaling to classify different atmospheric regimes and finally answer the question, what is the weather, what is the climate? Um, remember the conventional wisdom is the climate is what you get, the weather, the, the climate is what you expect, the weather is what you get. So climate is sort of long-term weather. Uh, is that really um, an adequate definition? Well, what you can do is you can revisit the data that I showed you uh, in the, 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 the spectral data and you can revisit it in real space, which will make things much clearer and avoid this a factor of 10 to the 15. Uh, you can use, in fact, what's, they're actually har wavelets. I call it fluctuation analysis because you don't actually need the whole wavelet um, machinery. The har fluctuation over an interval of, of, of an hour, say, would be the average, say, temperature of your first half hour minus the average of the second half. That's all it is. So it's a very, simple thing and it allows you to look at fluctuations in temperature over huge ranges of scale and the numbers you get actually have a simple interpretation so when the numbers are rising as they are over this weather regime up to about 10 days then um, you can interpret these as um, essentially differences 
So typical difference in temperature over uh, say one day here is gonna be about plus or minus three degrees or six degrees in all. That's from this location somewhere in um, Wyoming. And okay, and you can keep going like that when you get past um, 10 days, which is about the lifetime of planetary structures, then fluctuations actually start to decrease systematically. And um, so um, first of all, okay, I could put um, a few um, things here. What happens is that fluctuations decrease, decrease, decrease. So you have this, it looks like you're uh, the climate idea that is, you know, you more, you average more and more and you are converging, but somewhere in the Anthropocene at around 20 to 30 years, that changes. And here I have paleo data going back to the ice ages. And you see that, you know, this um, apparent convergence to a well-defined climate um, actually, you know, it, it's, it's illusory in the sense that the, the point at which you seem to be converging itself starts to vary. And at the moment, it's about um, at 15 to 20 year scales where the anthropogenic uh, the response to anthropogenic forcing is larger than the internal variability. But um, of course, even uh, pre-industrial, uh, that must occur because otherwise we wouldn't have ice ages and the ice ages are kind of plus or minus three degrees, at least in the high latitudes here. Um, as shown by this paleo data. So, okay, so um, what we have then is really three regimes. So you can call them what you like. Um, and, um, oh, I mentioned this is planetary structures, roughly the maximum here, but there's three regimes um, and uh, they differ by the way the fluctuations grow. So fluctuations grow with scale, you know, to power some power H. When H is greater than zero, then they appear to be unstable. The longer you wait, the more different, say, the, de the temperature, the more different, say, the temperature is. If H is less than zero, that means the more you average, you're killing out the variability. So you seem to be converging to a stable state. And so instead of the climate is what you expect, the weather is what you get, what you need is expect macro weather. The thing is, there's three regimes. There's this middle regime. Um, and it really is, um, you know, kind of an extension of um, the, the weather regime. It's just that you have structures that live longer than um, uh, 10 days. The, you know, so you're looking at many lifetimes of planetary structures. The GCMs uh, in control runs, that's all they generate. They, they gen they, you can get, you get macro weather forever and ever in a GCM with, you know, if it's in a control run. Um, to get a climate, then you need, in the GCM, at least you need a forcing. And in the real world, well, there's still a debate um, about why does the temperature start to uh, increase again at multi-centennial, multi-millennial scales. Those scales are too um, short to be directly caused by um, astronomical forcing. Uh, so is it internal variability um, or, or, or what? Um, you know, in, in some new internal uh, mechanism of nonlinear variability anyway. Okay, so another aspect then, once we've decided that we can, we can classify regimes this way, we can look at what are their statistical properties. And one of them is intermittency. So the simplest way to see intermittency is to look at, here I have Montreal temperatures that I've taken the, away the diurnal cycle. And I just look at the absolute change in temperature from one hour to the next. And uh, I've, I've uh, normalized it by its uh, average over 360 hours. And if this process was a Gaussian or quasi Gaussian process, then the maximum level of these changes would be this black line here. But you can see that you have some changes which are much, much stronger. I mean, this is 10 to the minus six probability if it was Gaussian, 10 to the minus nine. In you know, this 360 series long um, this data set, I have one here, which is something like 10 to the minus 15 probability. So it's totally non-Gaussian. Um, similarly, this climate series, I have 240 year resolution. I have, it's not as extreme, but I do have this 10 to the minus nine level fluctuation here. Um, and uh, I'll come back to macro weather in a moment, which indeed seems to be an exception, which is more or less quasi Gaussian, because I can do the same trick in space, right? I can look at the changes in space almost at one instant from aircraft data, reanalyses at one month or 140 year, this would be it from a reanalysis 
Uh, and you can see again, huge intermittency in space. And the only exception then is this macro weather regime. Actually, that, in a way that's fortunate because uh, this makes it much simpler. If things are more or less quasi Gaussian, then um, we can use um, you know, much more well-established mathematics. Uh, come back to that later. Uh, if for the other cases though, we really need a multifractal approach which treats each of these spikes as a kind of a singularity gamma. Lambda is the range of scales here. It's about 360. And then you can quantify the, the probability distribution of these spikes with a co-dimension function, which is the same at any scale, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't have time to go into that, but I could mention that some of the consequences of multifractals and you know, this took uh, several decades to really establish mostly starting um, in the 80s. So we have the scaling of the fields, uh, temperature, wind, et cetera. You have the random generation of strong structures, uh, singularities, uh, the fact that cascades are a kind of generic multifractal process. There are stable attractive universality classes, which means that actually we, you get uh, quite a lot of simplification um, of the multi, you know, it's, it, it's a kind of a generalization to multiplicative processes of um, the additive universality classes, which are Gaussian and Levy variables. Uh, we also have generically uh, power law extremes. So these extreme events, sometimes called black swans, and these are associated with spurious oscillations, say if we go to Fourier uh, domain. So all kinds of interesting things that uh, I could talk about in another uh, talk. Um, and so, okay, so why, why um, does the atmosphere have this huge scaling? Well, um, okay, fundamentally it's because the equations of the atmosphere don't have a characteristic scale. And, and so therefore the GCMs uh, don't have one either. And that's why the GCMs can do such a good job because they reproduce the scaling quite well actually. But it's still, it's a scandal that in 2020, there is no consensus on the large scale statistical properties of the atmosphere, right? We're sort of drowning in petabytes of data and there's no reason why uh, we can't come to a consensus about the statistical properties. But um, okay, uh, actually it's getting fairly clear. Uh, you can use satellite data, visible IR here, passive microwave, aircraft data, reanalyses, all of these up to planetary scales and you get beautiful scaling straight lines on a log log plot, say for um, the uh, spectrum in the horizontal. Um, so with some deviations at scales larger than maybe 5,000 kilometers, um, say for geopotential height here, but almost perfect scaling. Um, and actually you can compare the earth to Mars. Uh, so, you know, there's the idea in, tur in turbulence that you expect so-called universal turbulence laws. So, well, the best we can do is uh, solar system universality if we include Mars. And we find that actually the, we can look at huge numbers of statistical exponents for pressure, you know, meridional wind, zonal wind, temperature, different levels, et cetera. And they get almost exactly the same spectra with one or two minor exceptions. Um, and so really we have to agree today after, you know, decades really that there is no mesoscale gap. There's no fundamental, you know, gap at the scale of about 10 kilometers where you know, the sort of scale height of the atmosphere as was believed uh, starting in the 50s. Uh, and modified in the 70s to the idea of a gap between or a change of behavior between isotropic three-dimensional turbulence at small scales, isotropic two-dimensional turbulence at large scale. No, that just doesn't uh, happen. Um, I apologize to all those theorists that still like isotropic turbulence, but it seems that isotropic turbulence is just not relevant in, in the atmosphere as far as we can tell. We need anisotropic turbulence, which works actually very well. Okay, so uh, what about the future? I've talked about the past. So one of the options is to chase more details, as I mentioned. Uh, I don't, I think we're, we're heading for diminishing returns there. Um, and I think it's time that we started to uh, consider which details are relevant and which are irrelevant instead of just brute force calculating them all and then averaging most of them out. So what that means is that we really have to use stochastic models based on scaling or other symmetries. 
So uh, first of all, I should say that stochastic weather forecasting is a very hard problem. Essentially, it's a vector multifractal process problem. And OK, unfortunately, not much progress has been made, probably because no resources have been devoted to it. But um, it's actually quite promising. Um, but a much easier problem is the more or less, more or less Gaussian problem of macro weather, which has low intermittency, as I showed. So um, what, we should, what we could do is we could you know, say do projections or forecasts also. Um, and why, do we, why, do, why is that necessary? Well, the thing is what I've pointed out is that you know, we have these nice climate models, the GCMs, and they have actually very good, you know, in most cases, quite realistic scaling statistics with many of the right exponents, et cetera. And of course, if that wasn't true, then they would be bad models and they're not bad. The problem is that they don't have realistic climates. In fact, each GCM has its own climate. And that's ultimately the reason why they have this big dispersion of estimates of the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So what we have to do is make a model that has the same statistics, but or at least or maybe even slightly more realistic statistics. But um, we need to 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 anchor it to the real world in terms of um, the data. And so for that, we can use scaling models to force convergence to the real climate, if you like. And uh, so I mentioned scaling as a, as a, prin a symmetry principle we can use, but we can also use energy balance. And that's given rise to this fractional energy balance equation. And we can use the fractional energy balance equation to look at uh, make climate projections through 2100. So what is this equation? Well, for a globally average quantity here, the temperature, it's just um, a generalization of this very simple box equation or Vidico Sellers becomes of this form when you make a global average. So energy balance, uh, if H equals one, then um, you just have a standard relaxation to equilibrium. If you change the forcing, you increase the, the uh, watts per square meter of energy coming into the system, then uh, the, and S is the climate sensitivity, then the temperature will relax to in an exponential way to a new equilibrium. It turns out that if, the, um, if, you, if you put in the correct radiative uh, conductive boundary conditions of the surface, you can update the Badico sellers models. And uh, what you get instead is that actually continuum mechanics implies H is one half, not H equals one. And it's easy enough to generalize that further and it find out that empirically H is actually about 0.4. So when H is anything except an integer, then you have power laws rather than exponentials. So the power law, so the exponentials are really this very, very special case. And uh, so you can use the IPCC forcings. These are from the 2013 uh, fifth assessment report. You have you know, a relaxation time, which is now um, uh, power law relaxation, climate sensitivities, which are more or less in the range of the, um, it is three, three to plus or minus 1.5. We end up with about 2.43, et cetera. So, and you can make projections. Uh, before I show you the projections, you can just test this on the past. You make hind projections. So red shows actual data with 90% confidence intervals for global temperature since 1880. The gray, uh, uh, the 32 um, CMIP5 GCMs, this is their, so the spread is the 90% confidence limit and the me middle line is their median, um, the ensemble mean actually. Um, and you can see that the Phoebe projection is the blue. So one thing is it has a much smaller uh, uncertainty level, right? The uncertainty is from totally different causes. Actually, it's mostly from poor knowledge of the past forcings. Um, and uh, you can see that it's a little lower, but basically it has total agreement with the GCMs because the 90% confidence limit um, agrees. Uh, interestingly, the so-called pause in the warming is much better uh, modeled by the Phoebe, right? The GCMs got it a little too high. Um, so the Phoebe does, the blue does very well compared to the red, the data. Um, but you know, in science, we're used to the fact that if a single method gives you a result, that you can't, you know, you 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 can afford to be skeptical. But if two different approaches give essentially the same result, 
then you end up having much more confidence in both. So in that sense, we can say that the Phoebe supports the GCMs and the GCMs support the Phoebe. And so if we take a look at what does this imply for um, say the year 2100, um, we can project these forward. Again, we see almost complete overlap of the 90% confidence limits, slightly lower uh, Phoebe uh, projections, but um, you know, essentially the same uh, results. We get a slight, you know, the, the, the date at which we go past um, 1.5 degree threshold will be delayed a bit, but um, okay. So this is uh, work with uh, Roman Prochek um, as part of his master's thesis. Um, okay, we can also look at, I'm just about winding up here. Um, we can also uh, look at the high frequency approximation to Phoebe, which actually is um, a pure scaling um, model. Uh, I we call this the scaling macro weather model um, or SLIM. And we can use this for monthly and seasonal forecasts. This is work with um, my student, uh, Lennon Del Rio Amador. Uh, so this is this thing that uh, we produce called StockSips, the Stochastic Seasonal Interannual Prediction System. And it's based again on the Phoebe equation, uh, you, except you can make it regional. Uh, at high frequency limit, it just becomes a power law convolution, in fact, with a white noise here. So this ends up being, in fact, fractional uh, Gaussian noise. Um, okay, so you can, in fact, predict GCM control runs very well with this. Uh, and if we, okay, so wait a I, yeah, so I skipped the, um, the uh, regional forecasting, um, but, uh, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll give you this regional forecasting momentarily. I just wanted to show you the basic equations. Um, okay, this is maybe um, too much for this short talk, but the idea is that you have a temperature at a pixel I that depends on um, this uh, kernel here that you integrate over all the past times. So it turns out to be a, a power law and you weight it by a Gaussian uh, white noise. And the Gaussian white noise, the key point is that it can have spatial correlations, but there's no time correlation. There's delta correlated in time. And that's a very important point. So all of the temporal correlations come from this power law kernel, which has gives it, in fact, an extremely long memory. So, okay, so here uh, just shows you, you can use this to make these monthly, let's say this is a monthly forecast. So this is the Canadian GCM, CANSIPS. Um, you can see that the skill is actually um, negative uh, over land. The, you know, so blue is, is less than climatology, less skill, uh, red is better than climatology. Uh, basically it does worse over land uh, because the annual cycle is not so great in the model. Um, here, uh, stock SIPs does a bit better. Well, it's not great skill over land, but it's, at least it's positive. And interestingly, you can combine the two in a hybrid, which does better. This shows the improvement of the hybrid with respect to can stock. It actually improves things the most over land, which is, of course, where you need the skill the most. Um, so, okay, so that's actually been very successful. Five minutes. Okay, perfect. So uh, the question then arises, can we use data from other locations to improve slip? So all I've done to make those forecasts is to take long series at each data point, use the long, the, the very long memory from the power laws and use those to forecast the future at that point. So you would think that you could use say, you know, tele, you know there are teleconnections. So could, can you use teleconnections to uh, improve, let's say we know that we're having an El Nino. And we know that in general, when you have an El Nino, let's say Montreal is uh, warmer than usual. Can you use the El Nino information to improve that forecast further? So, well, okay, that's what is often believed, but um, is it true? And it's specifically, uh, we're, we're going to be looking at if I have a very long record in Montreal, will knowledge of the temperature elsewhere help me? So it's not, if I know the temperature this month, will temperature elsewhere help me? The answer is yes. But it's not obvious that if I have enough information in the past, that other information will help. So that question can actually be precisely answered with the notion of Granger causality. 
they'll come through momentarily. But um, just to show you the usual idea about teleconnections, you can see this very visually using network theory, right? So this is Sonus 2006, 500 millibar pressure anomalies. The red indicates um, a region which is so-called strongly connected to more than half the rest of the globe, right? So take a red pixel here on a pixel by pixel basis at, I don't know, one degree resolution. The correlation in the time series of temperatures or, or sorry, of pressures at this point, the correlation with the pressures at another point are above some threshold. And so you then create this idea of a network of connections. If you do the same with two degree temperature anomalies, you get something like this. And uh, actually with this slim model, you reproduce that in fact, almost perfectly. Um, so, but okay, so can these, um, uh, these, these networks and these connections help improve the forecast? Well, oh, before I get to that, I can show the model does pretty well. So this is the SLIM model. These are, this is showing an El Nino event that it's um, been developing. This is a purely random El Nino, right? So the date actually here has no meaning for the simulation. You can see this ONI, it's an El Nino index for three different SLIM simulations. You can compare it to the actual uh, El Nino index history based on reanalyses since 1948. So you can see that, you know, the, 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 it looks almost identical, you know, and statistically speaking, of course, once again, SLIM has totally random um, uh, sequence of events. And you can actually see that we're doing the SLIM is, has a more realistic El Nino uh, pattern. In fact, these are the patterns. Uh, and it's more realistic, in fact, than um, the um, reanalyses. Um, here you see these are really a bit too too strong. And okay, so it's very tough for a GCM to do this do this well. Um, okay, so coming back to this question about uh, teleconnections, can they help us improve our forecast? Well, the thing is that once you go beyond the you know you you, you want to look not just at the correlations at an instant right now. But you want to look at what about the correlations between now and one month in the future. So here you have the connections for um, uh, based on uh, one month in the future. So for the temperature, it's quite similar, almost the same actually for, for zero month lag. But for the innovations, that's this white noise um, that's building the process. You indeed find virtually no correlations. There's virtually zero correlations and that's, that means that in fact, um, the innovations are completely disconnected spatially. So on the one hand, you have strongly correlated temperatures, but that is, is a kind of a spurious result in a sense of these just long um, memories at each pixel. They tell you nothing about the ability of the uh, system to give you information at one point that could help you to predict at another point. There's essentially, the, the networks that people have been looking at um, essentially show uh, nothing about Granger causality and that's really what has to be shown. So the bottom line is if you have a sufficiently long time series then adding information from other locations does not improve the forecast. So, okay, so what, what have we accomplished with this? So um, we have a new understanding of atmospheric variability. We found that it was underestimated by a huge amount, uh, quadrillion. Uh, there are the question about which chaos, well, we, we could have deterministic and stochastic chaos. We don't have to say only one or the other. You know, deterministic or stochastic approaches can both be, um, can both be valid and coexist. Um, so that's, you know, same as which level, low or high. Um, the low level is, you know, all the, as many details as you can. The high level is looking for collect, you know, laws of collective behavior. Uh, we could answer the question, what is the weather? What is the climate? And you need macro weather for that. Oh, and here I have a shameless plug for my book. It came out about a year ago and that explains my point of view on all this um, with, uh, with, in fact, practically no mathematics. Um, uh, and there are new applications. So, uh, you know, we're used to, okay, 
Here we have 60 years now, we've been chasing the details, uh, building up uh, GCMs and numerical weather prediction methods. But um, you could also imagine, uh, you know, essentially stochastic turbulence-based uh, forecast methods. But as I mentioned, for the moment, that has not been uh, developed. That's something for the future. But for macro weather and the climate, what has happened is the um, GCM approach has added in all kinds of other things, uh, carbon cycles, ocean models, et cetera. So they become uh, earth system models. And uh, already we can see that at least for some of the field, well, specifically the temperature field, we can already produce uh, comparable, if not uh, better results uh, for, um, for predicting and projecting that. So I'll stop there and um, see if anyone uh, is interested in continuing the discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Sean. Really an interesting talk, as usual. We also have some questions to you. I can read it for you. The first question is from George Datseris. Can you please cite a paper that presents this corrected spectrum? I think it he refers to the Mitchell spectrum and the correction you made. Okay, well, that's easy enough. It was uh, a voyage through scales. Uh, the case of the missing quadrillion uh, was in climate dynamics in 2015. I can send, you can send me an email. I can, it's on my website in any case. You can download it for free. Now, okay. The second question is from Andrei Spiridonov. What is possible mechanism for uniformity predictability in macro weather time scales? What is the predictability uniformity? Yep, yeah, the possible mechanism. essentially energy balance um, constraint, which could also be considered a kind of a symmetry. Um, hope people can hear me. Um, so, okay, so what we've done up till now is just look at the high frequency part, which corresponds to, turns out that the energy storage mechanisms in either the, the earth or in the oceans have very long memories. And actually that is even true uh, just from classical uh, continuum mechanics, actually just uh, H is, is this H equals one half result, um, which uh, we just discovered actually um, last year. Um, but uh, so that, that in a way is the answer, right? You have this huge memory it takes a lot of time for energy to uh, diffuse into uh, the surface, the subsurface, the ocean uh, as well. And uh, it takes a long time for it to come out. And uh, that can be modeled and, and harnessed with this, uh, this approach. I don't know if that answers the question, but... <laughs> Uh, have I been cut off? And uh, now you're still there. Uh, am I? Tomato got cut off. I was cut off, was I? Uh, yeah, for a while. But also Tomato came out, and I don't know if he's here okay, again. Okay, well, I just I just moved to a place that might have a slightly better connection. <laughs> Sorry yeah, about that. Yeah, but I cannot read the chat at the moment. So can you read the question? Yeah, I can read that. Uh, so you were at, uh, yeah, the next one is by Joseph. The maximum of kind of fluctuation around 10 days might be related to the mid latitudes opposed to the tropics. I don't know if this is a question or is it just a comment. So do you want to comment on that, John? So I, I didn't uh, understand it very well. What, what was the question again? Uh, the question was the maximum of planetary fluctuations around 10 days may be related to the mid latitude opposed to the tropics. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, you know, skipped through that very quickly, but one can 
one can estimate empirically this transition time scale. First of all, it's a time scale that has been known, um, in fact, since the 1950s. And it had came under various names, uh, but every uh, field, every atmospheric field undergoes a, a drastic statistical uh, transition. You can see it in the spectrum very easily at something of the order of 10 days. Uh, now I say that uh, with a little bit of reservation because it does depend on um, your latitude and, uh, and, and, and location as well, but mostly latitude. And it turns out that if you estimate the energy flux uh, from the sun, basically the power per kilogram, per, per the energy rate density, right? So it's a power per, per mass. Uh, then you can use a Kolmogorov relationship and you can estimate rather accurately, actually, this transition time. And so it turns out that there's less um, energy rate density near the tropics than in the mid latitude. So actually, the transition time is often um, substantially longer than 10 days in the tropics. Um, and there are some regions, in fact, uh, because the ocean has a similar turbulent nature and the transition times though are more of the order of a year or so because the energy rate density is much smaller. And um, so over the El Nino region, for instance, you could have a transition time um, mostly you know, for surface temperatures, mostly influenced by um, the ocean temperatures that can be you know, many months actually, but okay. So, but it's essentially it's the um, the the uh, lifetime of planetary structures, um, and it's also uh, since it's based on uh, Kolmogorov law, in fact, that uh, it's also the uh, deterministic predictability limit for uh, deterministic uh, models. So I don't know if that answers the question, but. Okay, then the next one is from Noel Kinisai. Yeah, thank you for an interesting talk. How do you view the interaction between climate system components, for example, the atmosphere and ocean, and that Asselman's concept that explains part of the climate spectrum? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, Okay, that's maybe hard to, to, to answer quickly. I mean, okay, so Hasselman based his idea on, on or his approach on a rather general scale separation. He didn't actually explain why there is a scale spec separation. He knew that there was a scale separation uh, and he, he had the idea that, you know, essentially internal variability from weather would drive the system. And so that in fact is, um, you know, pretty much uh, the same as, as, as what I've been proposing, um, except that I think we could, we've clarified quite a bit, um, you know, the timescales and the, the nature of the transition. Um, and um, I think that we can, um, you know, well, we've clarified, I think, the nature of, of, of the macro weather and climate regime. Uh, the importance of scaling and various things. So I think things have moved on um, in terms of connections between different components. Well, actually you can, you know, so, 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 so Hasselman's approach has been used as a basis for a kind of a rather general dynamic systems approach. Uh, the thing is the dynamic systems approach is usually, um, you know, presented in the form of a, um, mathematically is a form of a flow, which is essentially a first order differential equation for the atmospheric state vector. It's supposed to describe all the, the different components of the atmospheric system. And it's supposed to be then, it's a, so it's a first order differential equation, which is then nonlinear, uh, nonlinearly forced by um, the entire state vector of the system. Well, what, um, what we're finding is with the, um, the Phoebe, if you like, is that um, there's a natural source for fractional uh, ordered derivatives. So the system is fundamentally forced by the solar radiation. That solar radiation is absorbed 
essentially with um, conductive radiative boundary conditions. So some of the radiation warms up the surface, which then leads to more black body emission, and some of it gets conducted into the surface and stored. And uh, that process fundamentally involves fractional derivatives. And so any component of the system, which is essentially directly driven by the sun, uh, naturally uh, has a, a fractional and not an integer order derivative. So at least part of the dynamical systems approach has to involve fractional uh, derivatives and not integer order derivatives. So, uh, and that will right away give us all kinds of long memory kind of um, behaviors. And I think it, it could um, make a big improvement actually in trying to understand say uh, Milankovitch forcings and stuff like that, because at the moment, all the chaotic models, uh, dynamical systems models give, you know, the, the, the spectrum is much too narrow. And if as soon as you put in um, the spectrum of the responses, temperature response is much too narrow. So as soon as you put in the fractional derivatives, then you naturally generate um, a wide range of, um, of scaling uh, response. So anyway, I think it, it does have applications uh, that way, but uh, that's still very much work in, uh, in progress at the moment. Right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the next one from Gabo Drotos. Please, could you elaborate on the relationship between deterministic spatial temporal with a high degree of freedom, chaos, and scaling laws? Okay, I mean, I think it's 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 really okay. The big breakthrough in, in, in deterministic chaos was the discovery that only a small number of degrees of freedom can give you uh, random like behavior. Um, the thing is up until, uh, up until then, you know, the standard turbulence view was that you know, the atmosphere had something like 10 to the 27 degrees of freedom, right? You, from the dissipation scale, something like say a millimeter or smaller, you know, uh, there were various, you know, Reynolds number to the nine fourths, or various classical estimates, um, and then with chaos theory came the idea that oh, actually, uh, maybe only a very small number of those degrees of freedom are important. Um, and some of the extremists even went to say maybe you know only say a dozen. In fact, there was a famous paper. 1984 in Nature by Catherine Nicolis that said the climate system only required four degrees of freedom. Um, so, okay. So on the one hand, you have the classical estimate 10 to the 27, and you had this extreme, you know, maybe four, uh, but with the development of multifractals, basically you have a, a more systematic way of looking at the relevant number of degrees of freedom. So. Uh, the 10 to the 27 is totally classical turbulence estimate of how many different details are important, if you like. Um, that assumes that you know, all the details have essentially the same level of activity, which is not at all true. So we know that most of, say, the energy um, fluxes and dissipation occur in very, very small fractions of the total volume of the atmosphere. Um, so multifractals, then, is a systematic way of uh, quantifying how many degrees of freedom essentially are important at any length scale and at any level of intensity. So, you know, so it's a huge step forward for uh, understanding, but the answer is still not four, right? It's still a big number. And so, um, and it's still a bigger number, you know, again, it depends on your length scale, depends on, on your intensity threshold, which one, you know, what you consider important and unimportant. But, uh, and it's still bigger than, than, than the GCMs, um, but it does allow you to, to have a rather quantitative understanding of this, uh, of this issue. Um, so I'm not sure if that again answers your question, but. Okay, we still have a couple of questions and then I would stop because we are well beyond 3.30. 
Uh, one is by Moritz Günther. Uh, when you say that the innovations of the temperature are unconnected, do you mean that in the sense of do you mean that in the sense of Granger causality or in another sense? No, no, in, a, in a, the very precise sense of Granger causality, that's what we mean, yes. And the thing is that you couldn't do this um, calculation, if you like, using you know, auto, the standard autoregressive approach, because essentially you have these long memory processes and you would need lots, you know, so most people would, would try to attack this problem, say with an AR autoregressive order one or two, really, um, you need a, a you know, auto regressive probably of the order of 20 or so, or you know, our model in fact is really infinite order. Um, and uh, so it would be impractical really to do a, a test of Granger causality, but our model, which reproduces um, you know, the data extremely well over the past, it does very good forecasts, et cetera, that has absolutely zero Granger causality. And you can make, uh, I didn't have time to show it, but you can show a, a film of these things evolving and you get you know, very realistic El Nino events and all kinds of things happening, all the spatial patterns and, and they're just totally random. So obviously you can't, you can never prove that the real world um, has no Granger causality, but the model which models it extremely well has no Granger causality, let's put it that way, right? That's the best you can ever do. So, I mean, so there's nothing wrong with network an analyses, it's simply that they're misleading, right? Or another way of looking at it is that, um, yeah, often network analysis is used to identify regions that could be used as co-predictors, but that's still with the idea that really you're looking at the problem as more or less an initial value problem, as the GCMs do. You start everything off at t equals zero with as much spatial information as you can, but what this problem is, says, no, this is not an initial value problem. It's a past value problem mathematically. You need, you know, you, you would really like an infinite series in the past at each point. It turns out that um, you can actually uh, use sophisticated estimation essentially to estimate the past that you don't have, uh, but you know, so you can actually do quite a good job even with a finite past, in fact, but, um, but the memory, you know, in principle, uh, ancient events still are still affecting thing. And the events really are, you know, energy going into and out of storage. In fact, that's what this is about in, the, in, in this precise case of the temperatures, yeah. Okay, then there's the last question by Dan King. I'm not familiar with fractional derivatives. Your comparison of TB and GCN in cast and forecast implies to me a filtering effect. Is that reasonable to restore that kind of interpretation? Is it, is it reasonable to what? First order kind of interpretation. Uh, is that a first or a good first order kind of interpretation? Um, yeah, okay, the I'm sorry, I'm sorry, your, your sound is not perfect at my end. Uh, oh, okay. Read, read. I, I, I can read that again. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, I read again. I'm not familiar with fractional derivatives. Your comparison of TB and GCM in cast and forecast implies to me a filtering effect. Is that a reasonable first order kind of interpretation? Okay, I'm sorry, I was still missing a word or two, but uh, is it? Can you so, read the chat? Maybe I should just read the chat. Yeah, I'm very sorry, but there were one or two. <laughs> no, it's fine, maybe it's my fault. Uh, well, your sound is not great, and the, and, uh, but I have to stop sharing for the chat, I guess. Um, let me see if I can see the chat. I'm not for fractional derivatives. Oh, okay, sorry. A filtering effect. Okay, sorry, that was the word that I was missing. Um, is there a filtering effect? Well, if you like, I mean, the, the a fractional derivative as in fact, as a normal derivative, actually it's a convolution 
Um, it's a kind of a trivial convolution for a normal derivative, but a fractional derivative is, um, is, is a convolution. So easiest way to think of it is indeed as a, as a power law filter in Fourier space. So, um, so yeah, I don't know, maybe, maybe that, that's, that's the answer to your question, is it? <laughs> um, so instead of, you know, exponential, it's, it's a power law. So for a white noise, if you had exponential, actually the, you would get an ornstein uhlenbeck process, which would have a cutoff, uh, say omega to the minus two spectrum. And with the uh, Phoebe, you're going to get um, an omega to the minus two H, where H is uh, not one anymore, closer to a half and a bit less than a half. Um, and then at the very low frequencies, you would get some other scaling, in fact. Uh, so you, anyway, and, and, and the relaxation time is something of the order of five years, apparently. Okay, yes, I think shown you satisfactory reply to Greg. <laughs> yeah, because the, he wrote on chat, yes. <laughs> Okay, Sean, really thanks again for your nice talk and for your time.